um, so many familiar faces and new ones and newly appointed ones. Um, the Nightdale Chamber and the Rotary recommend or uh, welcomes you all to this event. Um, and we'd like to thank the Rotary for sponsoring the Zoom platform that we're using today to make this happen. Uh, one thing that I think we all learned in the pandemic is where there is a will, there is a way. <laughs> And we definitely were still able to keep the Economic Forecast Forum going um, as it is a tradition every year. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce uh, Representative James Ro Robertson of the House District 39. We are very honored to have him here and would welcome any opening remarks that he has for today. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, very good. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm excited uh, for the uh, uh, entire state. Um, it seems like some good things are gonna be happening in the upcoming year. Uh, as many of you know, I have vacated my position as the mayor of Nightdale and accepted an appointment from Governor Cooper as the uh, representative for House District 39. And so I felt like it was a wonderful opportunity um, uh, for me, for my family, uh, but more importantly, for my community. Um, I still get to serve uh, Eastern Wake um, just from a broader perspective. And so uh, I'll be serving Wendell, Nightdale, Zebulon, as well as um, a part of Southeast Raleigh. But um, as one of the commissioners just mentioned, uh, I'm representing the entire state of North Carolina and I'm excited about that opportunity. My agenda does not and have not changed. Um, I'm a strong proponent of education and I will continue uh, to work hard uh, for uh, educational opportunities. I know that we have a large percentage of folks in the Eastern portion of Wake County uh, that only have a high school diploma. Uh, I'm excited that uh, Wake Tech um, has done its homework in identifying those vulnerable areas. And so I'm excited that we will have a new campus uh, coming online um, just uh, three miles from uh, the Nightdale community. And it will support Nightdale, Wendell, Zebulon and surrounding areas. Um, the college, um, as I said before, uh, did extensive research. And out of that research, um, information was shared in terms of a large percentage of folks with only a high school diploma. So uh, we realize at Wake Tech that not everyone is ready for a two-year degree, not everyone is ready for a four-year degree. However, there are values placed on certificates and diploma. Uh, diplomas. And uh, that work has been realized uh, through the efforts of Wake Tech and its partnerships with the business community. Uh, over the years, we've worked hard with members of the business community to place a value on diplomas and or certificates. So these are wonderful opportunities for our citizens uh, to take that next move and for us to bring uh, our citizens um, that are working, making minimum wage uh, from $8 an hour up to $25, $30, or $40 an hour uh, so they can compete for some of these jobs. As I've said before, education and economic, um, um, economic development goes hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. We have a lot of wonderful businesses that are moving to the area, job opportunities, but it, I think it's important that our citizens are able to compete for those jobs. So this is a wonderful opportunity and it is my hope. And I think it's my job along with our newly elected mayor of Nightdale, along with the other mayors uh, from Wendell and Zebulon to uh, foster these relationships with organizations and higher ed institutions like Wake Tech, um, our HBCUs, Shaw University, St. Augustine's University, North Carolina Central, and all four-year institutions to create access and opportunities uh, for uh, folks that 
are interested in going back to school or interested in getting trained or retrained. So I think there are gonna be some good times ahead of us uh, and I'm excited about it. Now I know over the past year, we've been plagued with this um, um, virus that has impacted a lot of us, a lot of our family members and friends. Um, as the mayor, the former mayor of Nightdale, uh, we made a, an assertive effort to make sure that everyone was adhering to the governor's guidelines that were put in place. Um, again, I would like to send a special thanks to each and every one of you for doing your part in keeping our community safe. Yes, we've lost some loved ones. We've lost some neighbors along the way. I think it's important, although there's relief coming around the corner, that we do everything possible, everything possible to continue to educate the community in terms of wearing a mask, uh, maintaining your distance and washing your hands. Uh, those things are important. And um, I'm counting on you, my counterparts, my citizens uh, of the Eastern Wake community to help get us through um, this, this terrible, terrible crisis. But as I said before, I feel confident that good things are coming down the road. I'm looking forward to serving um, uh, the entire state of North Carolina. And please know that uh, I'm accessible. Um, I'm excited about this opportunity. And I'm equally excited for uh, Mayor Jessica Day, uh, who has um, taken my role as the mayor of Nightdale. And so, um, you know, for many of you, you don't know that um, I started grooming Jessica some years ago, and um, I, I had always shared with her, this moment may come and you have to be ready. And this is a clear indication of what secession planning does and how, how effective it can be. So uh, congratulations to Mayor Day. I'm excited for you being the first African-American mayor for the town of Nightdale. And uh, that's a big accomplishment, but you've earned it, you deserve it. We look forward to working with you, partnering with you, and uh, I'm excited about this opportunity. Another big shout out to the Rotary, the Chamber, uh, for your efforts in putting on this virtual program. Um, I, I think you all have done an outstanding job and I'm excited for you. And please know that my door is always open. All you have to do is pick up the phone. I think Kristen will share that with you. Um, I'm accessible and I want to be accessible and I want to support your efforts because your success is my success. My success is your success. So this is a team effort. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I may have to um, leave the meeting early. Today is the first day of our session. And I also have a caucus meeting earlier this morning. And so um, I may not be able to stay the entire time, but I'll stay as long as I can to hear this valuable information that will be shared this morning. So thank you all so much. In the meantime, be well, be safe, and God bless. Thank you, Representative Robertson. Um, we all feel very excited and look forward to your, your new career and your new position. I, I can't wait to see the amount of lives that you will impact. Um, now we'd like to hear from our state treasurer, Dale Falwell, CPA, was sworn in as a state treasurer of North Carolina in January 2017. As the keeper of the public purse, Treasurer Falwell is responsible for 100 billion state pension funds that provide retirement benefits for more than 900,000 teachers, law enforcement officers, and other public workers. Uh, under Falwell's leadership, the pension plan was rated among the top five highest funded in the country and won accolades for proactive management and funding discipline. In 2018, the state coveted AAA bond rating was reaffirmed by every major rating agency, making North Carolina one of only 13 states in the country to hold that distinction. Treasurer Falwell also oversees the state health plan, which provides medical and pharmaceutical benefits to more than 720,000 current and retired public employees and is the largest purchaser of healthcare in North Carolina. Um, thank you for being here. We're very gracious to have you. 
Treasurer Falwell, and please feel free to make any remarks that you would like. You're on mute. How about now? Can you hear me? Okay, yes. good. Uh, good morning, thank you for having me. I wanted to congratulate Mayor Day and uh, Representative Roberson for their ascension uh, uh, from local government to state government and uh, having people who served in local government is very valuable to the General Assembly because there are uh, a majority of members of the General Assembly who have no local government experience and it's just highly important. So uh, the General Assembly will be blessed, Representative Roberson, by your presence and an understanding of, of what really happens <laughs> in local government instead of what people think or happens. Uh, Kristen, I want to thank you and the chamber for uh, and others for putting this together. Uh, most of you are too young to remember, but there used to be a congressman from the Greensboro area, United States congressman by the name of Howard Coble. Now, he, uh, he had a couple of points of distinction. One is, is that you should know that he's the only uh, person that in history, uh, while he was a member of Congress, renounced his social security check because he didn't think the government should be paying him twice. Uh, that's a true lie, sign of a public servant is when you say, don't give me this money because I'm already being paid elsewhere. But specific to uh, this meeting today, he used to go home to Alamance County and his mom would put this big spread up on the table and, and Howard would say, thank you. And, his mom would look at him very sternly and say, well, Howard, it just didn't jump up on the table by itself. Uh, this event just didn't jump up on the table by itself. So I wanna congratulate all those of you that had a part in doing this. Very briefly, uh, the state of the state is, uh, is good financially. And uh, as we know that when the money's right, other things eventually tend to take care of themselves. So very briefly, uh, the state, we, OSBM and the controller's office applied uh, about seven, eight, nine months ago for $4 billion of COVID CARE Act money. Uh, when that money was received, uh, we immediately, as you can expect, <coughs> put that in interest bearing accounts. Uh, but very quickly thereafter, 471 million of that was swept out uh, for the benefit of three counties and one city. And you all know we have 100 counties and 550 cities, not three counties in one city. Uh, but this was an act of Congress and the three counties that got this special appropriation were Wake, Guilford and Mecklenburg and the one city is Charlotte. Now, this is a little bit of treasurer humor, so I hope you all get it. Uh, no one at Charlotte ever asked me this question, but I do get asked this question often. Why didn't Raleigh get any of that money? And the answer is mathematical. Congress had set a floor of 500,000 residents uh, in order to get this special allocation. And even though there's a lot of people in Raleigh, because of the other uh, great incorporated areas in Wake County, like Nightdale, for example, uh, there aren't 500,000 people inside the city limits of Raleigh. And that's why only Charlotte got the special appropriation. That left about three and a half billion. And I believe Representative uh, Roberson, that was, uh, uh, both chambers unanimously approved two pieces of COVID legislation uh, that uh, ultimately uh, became law. And so all of the nearly $4 billion of COVID CARE Act money that was applied for last spring has been either spent or appropriated. The state has about a $2 billion budget surplus from the previous year. And as you can imagine, that's gonna come in very handy as you've heard especially from Dr. Waldron and others that the state is, is facing uh, multi-billion dollar uh, budget shortfalls. So having a budget surplus from the uh, calendar 19 fiscal year is, is highly important. We have about a billion dollars in the rainy day fund and it's only by the grace of God that we got as far down into the storm alphabet as we did this year and North Carolina is not be more highly impacted by storms and hurricanes. 
uh, we our thoughts and prayers go out for anyone who was impacted in this state and other states. But uh, to get that far into the alphabet and not to be more impacted is is, is a grace of God. Uh, there's uh, around two billion dollars still left in the unemployment trust fund. That is a far different story than I inherited uh, eight years ago uh, when I was uh, put in as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce in charge of unemployment. At that time, especially you business owners uh, might remember, we had 2.7 billion in unemployment debt. And the reason that matters, especially to the businesses that are on this call is that uh, hopefully you don't wake up and think about FUDA, which is federal or SUDA, state unemployment tax surcharges but if you're a business person, you do think about those things. And as long as that debt was outstanding, uh, there were payroll surcharges being placed on every employer in North Carolina, every employer in North Carolina for about the entire century up until 2014. And that is a disincentive toward attracting and retaining businesses in, in our state. So uh, from 2013 in March, carry forward about 30 months, the 2.7 billion of debt was paid off and over a $1 billion surplus was built that ultimately grew a year ago next month to $4 billion surplus pre-COVID. And that resulted in, um, in those surcharges going away. And it provided a cushion and a reserve fund as we faced this nearly 1 million unemployed people in North Carolina due, due to COVID. So. Uh, I will tell you that there are a lot of states who have already burned through their uh, unemployment surcharge, uh, their unemployment reserves. Therefore, they're going to be back into the surcharge business, another competitive advantage for North Carolina uh, companies and North Carolinians and uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Nightdale. Uh, my frustration um, uh, is with Congress. We appreciate the money that was sent down, but as you can imagine, anytime Congress sends us anything, it has strings attached. Uh, as uh, Mayor Roberson realized that if the string is attached from Washington, it stays attached when it gets to Nightdale, and he'll soon learn that it stays attached when it comes through the General Assembly on its way to Nightdale. <laughs> um, my point of saying that to you is, is that uh, one of those strings was that the money had to be used for COVID-related activities. Uh, what in this world, Mayor Day, is not COVID-related activity, starting with the fact I had to bring on bacon to this meeting this morning. <laughs> Everything is COVID-related. Uh, and the fact is, is that because of these budget shortfalls, uh, we would have been nice if that string would have been loosened so that the state, the county, the cities could have used some of that COVID Care Act money to backfill their, their budget shortfalls. My fear uh, my fears for rural North Carolina, especially Eastern rural North Carolina. Uh, and uh, Representative Roberson talked a little bit about this earlier, uh, but if, if he and I were to go to the Outer Banks today, ultimately we would go through Terrell County. I was the drive-through uh, commencement speaker last year uh, at the graduation of the only high school in that county, which is Columbia High School. There were 38 graduates. As a matter of fact, the number of people that live in that county is about equal to the student faculty population at Myers Park High School in Charlotte. The total number of citizens in the county is about equal to the citizenship of a high school. The county commission chair, Mr. Everett, once uh, joked to me, he thinks he may have more bears in Terrell County than there are people. But getting back to serious business for a moment, why does that matter to you? Uh, the reason it matters to you is that it's great to have a strong torso, which is the triangle, the triad, and the, and the Charlotte-Mecklenburg area. But rural North Carolina represents our legs and our arms, uh, and they have to be equally strong. In Terrell County, for example, half of the property in that county is off the tax rolls. Now, Mayor, just think about trying to balance the, the Nightdale budget if half the property was not taxable for real estate taxes. And now uh, the punchline, which I haven't told you, is that between St. Patrick's Day and July 4th of last year, the sales tax revenue fell 27% in Terrell County. So a population the size of a high school, half the property is not taxed. Sales tax revenue falls 27%. 
And the combination of all those things is what's used to fund things that the representative and others on this call care about public education, public safety, public works, and public roads. So you can very easily see why my, my fear is for rural North Carolina, especially Eastern rural North Carolina. So as we uh, proceed at the treasurer's office, uh, thank you for that introduction. And we're pleased to report, we need to upgrade that uh, bio. Uh, the pension plan now is $115 billion. Uh, we're paying out on a gross basis now in benefits over 6.5 billion dollars per year. That's over 550 million every 30 days to those that have taught, protected, or otherwise served at the local and the state level. So when I'm asked by fourth graders, you know, what do we what do I, we do at the treasurer's office? I just simply describe it as that we're in the check delivery business. That and all we do on a daily basis is we make money and save money for those that teach, protect, and otherwise serve and taxpayers like them who help fund these plans. When you add everything together, uh, we have about $200 billion in, that we manage at the treasurer's office. Uh, just the pension plan is that David is the 26th largest pool of public money in the world. And the $200 billion, when you add everything that we do together uh, is eight times larger than the North Carolina budget. So as I uh, always say, and I keep these little clips around, uh, with all the stuff that's dividing our country uh, right now, uh, there's no uh, Democrat and Republican money at the treasurer's office. These are my my red and my uh, blue paper clips. Uh, there's no white and black money at the treasurer's office. Uh, the only color we recognize at the treasurer's office is green. And uh, being in the check delivery business, uh, uh, we are, have established a culture here of, uh, that's based on the blood that runs through me, which is Quaker. Uh, and one of the spices of the Quaker religion is to be fair and just. Uh, we don't pick and choose which laws to apply and which people to apply them to. So that's what we do. Uh, I'm not sure I'll have time on this call to mention, but uh, uh, at the end, I want to say something about nccash.com. It's, it's, it's only a I shouldn't say only, but it's only 900 million of the 200 billion that we manage, but uh, it never fails that I'm on a call like this and somebody doesn't have um, something at the treasurer's office at nccash.com uh, that belongs to them, either as an individual or their child or under a maiden name or a business or a nonprofit or, or something like that. So uh, with that, I'll uh, yield the rest of my time back over and uh, I'll look forward to the questions and and uh, in, the, in the memory of former Congressman Howard Coble and his mom, uh, this didn't ju just didn't jump up on the table by itself. And I appreciate you putting it together. And I look forward to the, to the other speakers and the, the questions. Thank you so much uh, for your follow up. That was a delight. And we look forward to your participation on the panel as well. Um, it should be a great conversation. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Walden. Dr. Michael Walden is a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor and Extension Economist at North Carolina State University and a member of the Graduate Economics Faculty with the Poole College of Management. His PhD degree is from Cornell University and has been at NC State since 1978. He has also been a visiting professor at Duke University. He also serves as a member of the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Board of Economic Advisors. Dr. Walden has teaching, research, and extension responsibilities at NCSU in the areas of consumer economics, economic outlook, and public policy. He has published eight books and over 250 articles and reports, including the North Carolina in the Connected Age, published by the UNC Press. He has served on several local and state commissions. With his wife, he is the co-author of three economic thrillers, Macro Mayhem, Micro Mischief, and Fiscal Fiasco, designed to teach economics in an entertaining way. Dr. Walden can be frequently seen, heard, and read in the media. He has a daily radio program aired on stations around North Carolina for which he has won two national awards. 
He is often interviewed on local TV and radio news broadcasts, has appeared on NBC, CBS, The Fox Report, and The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and is frequently quoted in such newspapers as USA Today, The News and Observer, The Charlotte Observer, The Boston Globe, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. His biweekly column, You Decide, is carried by over 40 newspapers in the state. He has made over 2,500 personal presentations. Dr. Walden directs the semiannual economic forecast to the North Carolina Economic Outlook. He has won numerous academic and public awards, including two champion Tuck Awards for Excellence in Broadcasting, the UNC Board of Governors Awards for Excellence in Public Service, and the Order of the Longleaf Pine in 2013, and the Holiday Medal for Excellence from North Carolina State University. His newest books are Real Solutions, Common Sense Ideas for Solving Our Most Pressing Problems and Disunion, a political thriller. And Dr. Walden, I have to say, you are a, <laughs> a thriller to watch. So we're very <laughs> much excited to have you here. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here. Well, thank you, Kristen. And Kristen's going to help me with the slides. I always like to put the technical challenges, uh, throw them off to someone else. But uh, a pleasure to be with all my great friends in, in Nightdale. Uh, congratulations to do ma new Mayor day, day. And congratulations to my good friend, former Mayor Roberson, now Representative. Uh, and may and uh, Representative, we're going to have to do some suit buying together uh, when things calm down. And I'm always, always a pleasure to be on a panel or a meeting with uh, Treasurer Falwell, as well as all the rest of the folks here. So thank you very much for inviting me. I think this might be the, I don't know, 25th, 30th, 35th time that I've spoken to um, this event uh, for Nightdale. We used to do it at noon, and um, now we've moved it to the first thing in the day. So let's get it, let's go forward. Uh, next slide, Kristen. Um, I'm going to look at the uh, state of the economy. Let me start by saying that the about a year ago, Economists were still very, very bullish about the economy. Uh, the numbers were, were all headed in the right direction. We had growth, we had rising wages, 50 year low unemployment rates, low inflation. Uh, folks at the lower end of the economic ladder were seeing improvements. And um, uh, COVID was just not on our radar screen yet. And we thought this would continue for another year. In fact, we'd already set a record for the longest period of time between recessions, and we thought we'd add another year to that. Next slide. Unfortunately, COVID came. And the problem with COVID, uh, as the medical experts uh, quickly ascertain, is it was uh, contagious, uh, it was deadly. Um, now, a lot of these viruses pop up every year. I've, I've read a lot about viruses recently, more than I ever wanted to. And a lot of them, most of them don't manifest into these pandemics. So it could have been a false alarm, but unfortunately it turned out to be our worst nightmare. Next slide. The medical people said uh, that we needed to worry about overwhelming our healthcare system. So um, after a month or so that where we recognized this was a problem, uh, most states uh, sometime in March issued a series of orders to limit personal interaction in the economy. So here in North Carolina, we had the stay at home orders. Uh, we had shutdown orders for some, some businesses. And we, be, in this case, the we being economists knew this would cause a recession. I like to call it the mandated recession because it's unlike any recession, at least that I've, I've lived through. I think I'm in my eighth or ninth recession as a professional economist. Uh, this was a session, recession we, we decided we had to accept and live through in order to, to manage the virus. Next slide. Now, another thing that economists thought was, although this, this would be a severe recession, we thought it would be rather short. Uh, and that's, that prediction seems to have come true. The worst quarter uh, was the second quarter, uh, April, May, June. Uh, you may, some of you may remember the headlines uh, when we got the data in for that quarter. Uh, the annualized numbers, meaning we took what happened. This is this this gets in, this gets in the weeds for economic statistics. But what economists like to do often is quote numbers as if they happen for an entire year, and this is one of them: GDP, gross domestic product. On an annualized basis, uh, the economy was down 32 percent in the second quarter. Uh, th that was the headline. 
uh, headlines in most papers. Um, that was a record. We didn't even see numbers like that in the Great Depression of the 30s. Now, the actual drop was about 9%. But what economists like to do is to say, well, if this drop in the second quarter lasts for a whole year, uh, roughly multiplied nine by four, now you don't get 32, uh, but there's some seasonal adjustments there. Uh, if that actual drop in the second quarter continued for a whole year, we'd be down 32%. Regardless of how you measure it, it was a bad reduction in the economy. Next slide. Now, looking at something we can all understand much better, uh, these two th these two charts show the uh, change in jobs. The left hand chart shows you the change at the national level in millions. The right hand in North Carolina in thousands. First thing that pops out is April. April was the devastating month. At the national level, we lost over 20 million jobs. In North Carolina, we lost about 600,000 jobs. Now, if you look past April. What do you see? Actually, you see gains in jobs. At the national level, we've, we, we gain jobs for every month up until December. It doesn't show up very well here on the scale. But in December, we got these numbers out a couple of weeks ago. Actually, at the national level, we lost 140,000 jobs. Now, most people say, most economists say that was due to the resurgence of the virus that we've seen. And some states issued, uh, reissued um, more restrictions. Now here in North Carolina, we just got these numbers out yesterday. So your chart here is up to date. We bucked that trend. We continued to add jobs in December. In fact, we actually added jobs at a faster pace uh, than we did in November. So that says, I think, a lot about our state. And I'll talk more about the competitive position of our state later. Next slide, Kristen. Now this, this shows you a slightly different version. What I'm doing, what I've done here is express the job changes in each month as a percent of the jobs that we had pre-COVID, which would have been in February. I've also added the triangle here, uh, which obviously Nightdale is a part of. So if you look at this slide, you see actually March, we had beginning of the pandemic, we, we had the reduction in jobs, very slight though. April, again, the devastating month. 14% uh, job loss the nation, about 12 in, in North Carolina. Interestingly, the triangle, we lost uh, more than 14%. That was actually, when I looked at the numbers, I was actually surprised to see that. I think the, the reason for that would be that because of the, the triangle's economy, because of the composition of the economy, we have a lot of folks who work in the hospitality, leisure, uh, travel, restaurant area hotels, and of course, as, as I'll talk in a moment, that sector was absolutely slammed. Now, again, the good news, if you look beyond April, uh, in every month, except at the national level in December, uh, we had job we had job gains, and, and including for North Carolina in December. I, we don't have the triangle numbers yet for December. So again, this shows that North Carolina has actually done a little bit better than the nation recently. But uh, you know, the other thing you can see is we had a fairly good rebound in jobs in May and June. Uh, then the rate of growth uh, seemed to uh, taper off. Next slide, Chris. Uh, this looks at the unemployment rate. Uh, so showing the same pattern. Again, you can see April, the worst month, improvement since then. You can see the triangle's unemployment rate has consistently been below both the national and the uh, North Carolina unemployment rate. Now, I wanna, I wanna pause here for a moment because economists think that the unemployment rate right now during COVID is not a good representation of what's happening in the labor market. And the reason has to do, and I have to get in the weeds a little bit here, the reason has to do with how unemployment is calculated. Most people think that the unemployment rate that we hear quoted comes from data that states get from the people, from people filing for unemployment compensation. They think that the, those data are collected in each state and they think, well, those data then are used to calculate how many people are out of work and the unemployment. That is not the case. The federal government does a separate national survey of about 110,000 people. Uh, and then they break that down by state to calculate the unemployment rate. And this is the way it's always been done. Uh, the other thing about that is that to be counted as unemployed in these numbers, this is these are the official unemployment rate numbers, a person has to answer yes to three questions. 
First question is, um, or I'm sorry, I have to answer no and then two yeses. First question is, do you have a job? Uh, if you say no, uh, then they continue. If you say yes, then you're counted as unemployed. I'm sorry, counted as employed. So you have to say no, I don't have a job. Then secondly, you have to say, I want a job. Now, why that? Well, there are a lot of retired people like my wife. My wife, the day after she retired, after teaching elementary school for 32 years, she told me very clearly and bluntly, I'm never working again. I put in my time, uh, and she did. Tough, uh, I don't know any job harder than uh, teaching public school or teaching K through 12. Um, my job's a piece of cake compared to what K, K through 12 teachers do. So pat them all, all in the back whenever you see them. Um, uh, so we don't want to count her as unemployed. We don't want to count people who maybe are taking a break from working. We don't want to count them as unemployed. So you have to, you have to say, yes, I want a job. And then here's the clincher, the third one. You have to tell the uh, survey taker that you have been actively looking for a job in the last month. Uh, that is, you're sending out resumes, visiting potential employers, contacting employers, whatever. There are a whole series of things that qualify you for that. Now you might say, well, why? Why is that included? Well, this goes back actually to when these rules were formed, not recently, but in the 1940s. And at the time, the thought was they, they wanted to question and gauge the intensity to which someone wanted a job. They were worried that they would overcount unemployment if someone said, yeah, I, I want a job, but if they're, they're kind of, they're not really into looking for work, they don't want to count them as unemployed. Uh, now, what's the problem now? What the problem is now is we think we have more people who are saying they're not looking for work, not because they're lazy, but because they don't want it, they're worried about COVID. Uh, they don't want to go out in public. They may have had COVID themselves. They may have a relative or very importantly, they may have children who are not going to school. They're, they're home, maybe, maybe virtually learning, and they have to take care of those children. So the, 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 now we don't have official numbers on this. These are estimates by economists, but we, we think that the real REAL unemployment rate right now is not those that are, that are shown here, which for all three entities here were around 6%. We're probably two percentage points higher. We're probably closer to 8%. Now we've still made progress since uh, April, but the point is these numbers show that we've made more progress than we think has really been made. All right, next slide, Kristen. Uh, now, another thing that is very clear, and, and uh, th th this was emphasized yesterday when the state issued its December unemployment report or job market report, and there, there was therefore uh, an ability to look back at the entire year of 2020, uh, the job market has been affected differently by the COVID-19 recession depending upon what economic sector you're in. And I don't have all the economic sectors here, but, I, but, but I, this gives a good contrast. The biggest losers in terms, doesn't matter how you measure it, number of jobs lost, percentage of jobs in February, doesn't matter. Uh, biggest losers have been hospitality and leisure and personal services. Now it stands the reason why those jobs in, in most cases require a lot of face-to-face -face contact. And so some of those some of those sectors were actually forced to close uh, by government mandate, like in the restaurant business, or, or they've had to adjust, like in the uh, fast food restaurants where they're doing drive through rather than sit down. Uh, in fact, in April, the worst month of the COVID-19 uh, recession, the hospitality and leisure section sector, both in North Carolina as well as nationally, pretty much anywhere you look lost half their jobs, half of their jobs. Never, I've never seen anything like that before in my, my career. Uh, now they have made, they, these sectors have made comebacks, but they're still well down from the ones I'm gonna talk about in a moment. In fact, hospitality and leisure took another hit in December because of the fact that some states uh, strengthened their, their uh, restrictions. In fact, that sector nationally lost um, 240,000 jobs. Uh, in, in December. Now, on the right-hand side, you see sectors, financial services, professions, construction, education, government, all of these have had much smaller job losses, either numbers or percentage. Uh, what, is, what is common among, among many of these, not all, is many of these jobs are jobs where you could continue to work. 
even if you were told to stay home. I'm a good example of that. I've continued, I've still got a paycheck from North Carolina State University. I continue to work, classes, meetings like this, research, et cetera, because of this great technology that we're using. Uh, construction was deemed an essential service. So those folks have continued to work. I can tell because I'm not too far from the Beltline construction that's going on in, in West Raleigh. Um, so yes, these sectors did lose jobs, but most of them now are 100% back. Uh, now, the other issue with what I'm displaying on this slide is if you think about the pay, the salary, the wage in these two groups, the left-hand side, um, many of those jobs, if not most, tend to be lower paying. They tend to be, for many people, entry-level jobs, part-time jobs. My first job was in a sector where every, every order I took, I said, do you want fries with that? Uh, but I didn't spend my career there. It was a, it was a, a work through school and then, and then work my way up the ladder. But the reality is many of those jobs are very low paying. On the other hand, the right hand side, many of those jobs are high paying, professional jobs, fin uh, financial services jobs, et cetera. So what, what not only are these, this, has this division uh, created differences in terms of uh, how jobs have been hit and, and return, but they've also widened income inequality. And that's an issue I think that we'll, we'll need to uh, worry about as, uh, as we get past the pand pandemic. All right, Chris, next slide. Uh, now, uh, Treasurer Falwell alluded to this. Um, uh, the federal government has uh, stepped up very quickly and did step up very quickly because they knew that um, uh, our leaders in Washington knew that this was going to, with, with the mandated shutdowns and the stay at home orders, this was going to clobber the economy. So actually Congress worked fairly rapidly uh, with the president uh, in getting money out into the states and into people and into businesses. So we had the stimulus checks, we had the payroll protection plans, we all had a whole variety of them. We've had several of these stimulus programs. Of course, one, another, uh, the Biden administration is probably gonna recommend um, the 1.9 trillion and that's gonna be debated. So that's not included here, but to date, the federal response has been to infuse the economy with about $4 trillion and push that out into the economy. Now, as Treasurer Falwell indicated, most of these, most of this spending had severe strings of time tied to them. North Carolina uh, has gotten about 30, around 39 billion of that. Again, a lot of strings uh, tied to it. Now, where's all this money come from? It's been borrowed. It's been borrowed. And certain our national debt has gone up by $4 trillion, probably is going to go up by more. And so the que one question I often get is, well, should we have done this? And my answer, this is Walden's answer only, is yes, I think we had to do it because we had an economy that was stumbling. Uh, and if, we had, if the federal government had not used its power to borrow money from the future, which is an enormous power, we, we would not have an economy perhaps when COVID uh, went away. So I think this was probably absolutely necessary. People can quibble over how it was done. I mean, there's a lot of concern about a lot of these programs maybe weren't targeted to those most needy as it could have been. I think initially the government simply wanted to get the money out there and then wanted to get out there fast. But we have borrowed from the future, which in economic terms means we won't be growing as fast in the future. Uh, so in essence, what we've done is borrowed growth in the future and brought it back to, uh, to today. So there, there certainly is a cost of what we've done, but I think in my opinion, my evaluation, it was something that had to be, had to be done. Next slide, Kristen. Federal Reserve's also gotten in the act. Uh, Federal Reserve, um, people have asked me over the years, well, then is there any job that would have gotten you to leave NC State? I've been at NC State now 43 years, loved every minute of it. Is there any job that would have gotten you away from NC State? And I usually uh, answer yes, one job. That would have been being a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, being appointed as that. Uh, and, the re and I jokingly say, although I'm serious, but I also try to ask some humor and say, because where else could you be in a job where you create money? That's a great power to have. But the Federal Reserve does have that power. In fact, a lot of the debt that the um, um, president and the Congress, through their joint efforts with the, the COVID packages, uh, has borrowed, uh, that debt has been uh, bought by the Federal Reserve. And you might say, well, where's the Federal Reserve get their money? They create it. They create it. I'm sure Federal Treasurer Falwell would like to have that power, but, but uh, we don't do that. We can't have that power at the state level. 
Uh, now, is there a cost to all this money creation and the fact that the Federal Reserve has pushed interest rates effectively to zero? Yeah, there are two worries that most economists have right now. Let me take the second one first. Inflation. Uh, I remember when I took my first economics class over 50 years ago, um, when the uh, professor was introducing us to inflation, he said, he said I'm, gonna create, I'm going to quote a great um, Nobel Prize winning economist, Milton Friedman, he has a simple explanation for inflation. He said, inflation results when too much money is chasing too few goods and services. So one concern is all this money that the Federal Reserve has infused in the economy, is that going to eventually create a situation, maybe not now, but a couple of months ahead when the economy gets better as people are gonna go out and be buying right and left and there's just not gonna be enough to buy. And so prices will go up. And most of the economic forecasts uh, are predicting higher inflation. Now, how much higher? Well, we're about one and a half percent now, maybe up to two and a half, three. So we're not talking about double digits, but we are talking about higher inflation, which means if you're a wage earner, salary earner, you need to obviously keep pace with inflation and for those of you in government, that means that people who are on government payrolls are probably going to be looking at a higher weight, a higher um, uh, salary increases down the road in order to keep pace with inflation. So I do expect inflation to go up somewhat. The other concern is speculation. A lot of this money that the Federal Reserve, I'm sorry, that the federal government has infused in the economy, particularly to households, ironically has been saved um, and, and, and not spent. And where has that money then gone while it's being saved? A lot of it's gone in the stock market because there's no other place you're gonna to go to get a good rate of return. And so the concern right now is have these lofty levels that we've seen in the stock market, are they speculatively high? And uh, will at some point the market turn and will we have a major downturn? I'm not smart enough to predict that, but I do think it's a concern that we need to watch. Next slide, Kristen. All right, Treasurer Falwell talked about state and local governments losing rev revenue. He's absolutely right. He's, he's absolutely right that at the state level, uh, the state controller uh, issued a report a few months ago saying North Carolina has about $4 billion of unspent funds. So, so from that perspective, we look, we are in much better shape than most other states. I think the real issue, in my opinion, but I defer to Treasurer Falwell, he does, this is what he does for a living, but I, I, I think he was intimating the big problem is going to be at, at the local level uh, because locals don't have uh, this, this, this un, un, these unspent monies that the state has. Local obviously don't have the power to, to borrow money uh, for anything like the federal government has. They don't have the power to print money. So I, I, do, I do worry about our, our local level of government in terms of the upcoming months. And so we need to watch our revenue growth. We need to watch. The one, the one good thing for locals is the real estate market has been doing very, very well. So housing values have been going up. In fact, there was a report yesterday, this is not, not at the uh, local level, but at nationally, housing prices in the last uh, year, and this is looking at the same houses. So we're adjusting for characteristics. Housing prices at the national level went up 10% in the last year. And so uh, locals obviously get a lot of their funds from uh, real estate. So if, if you're in a local uh, market, like Nightdale is where um, uh, growth is occurring and real estate values are occurring, that, that could be a savior here in terms of uh, your budget. Next slide. All right, now let me turn to, uh, and I'm watching the clock because I'm, I'm a stickler for keeping on time. Let me turn to where I think the future is. This is something I do called a leading index for the North Carolina economy. It's measuring not the size of the economy now, but the direction. If you look at the right-hand side, you see recently it's been, it's been pointing strongly up, meaning that it is forecasting that North Carolina's economy will be getting better in the, uh, in the future. Next slide, Kristen. This is my projection for North Carolina's real GDP. That's just a fancy term for the production of goods and services in the state. We have an economy that produces over $500 billion of economic output. I think we're the ninth biggest economy in, in the state. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, you can see we had a, a big drop in the second quarter. We had a good rebound in the third. And although I do think there may be a few shaky uh, months here due to the resurgence of the virus, you can see uh, I'm not showing growth for the fourth quarter. I do think that we're pointing upward. And indeed, by the end of uh, this year, we should be back uh, to pre-pandemic levels for our overall state economy. Now, this doesn't mean the virus didn't hurt us. It did. All that money and revenues and spending uh, and wealth that was lost, that's lost permanently. 
But in terms of our overall economic activity level, I think, I think there are bright days ahead for North Carolina. Next slide, Kristen. A uh, little bit different perspective on the unemployment rate. Now, this is the official rate. Uh, again, you can see the big jump in the second quarter improvement since then. Now, again, these numbers don't include that two percentage point bump that I think we, we would uh, use to get real unemployment. But notice that I'm looking, I'm showing actually a rise in unemployment this quarter, next quarter. You might say, well, and what's that, what's that, what's happening there? You're saying the economy is going to get better. How come unemployment is going to go up? This is because those folks that I mentioned who aren't looking for work, who, who, who need a job, but they're not looking, and therefore they're not officially counted as unemployed. When more people get back vaccinated, uh, confidence gets up, uh, businesses reopen, those folks are gonna start looking for work and until they get work, they're gonna be now recounted as unemployed. So don't be surprised if we actually see the unemployment rate numbers get worse early this year. And that happens, that, that's not unusual. I, probably one of the, the most challenging explanations I can give to someone like Anna Rivera, who's a reporter for Channel 11, when we have a number that comes out that shows in a given month, jobs went up, so is the unemployment rate. How can that happen? Is that a mistake? I have to go through this, this explanation, of course, in, in 15 or 30 seconds or less. But anyway, bottom line here, don't be surprised if the unemployment rate goes up in the early part of this year. That actually be a good thing and then it'll go down. But notice, uh, we're not gonna get back, in my opinion, to that nice 3.8% we had pre-pandemic because we're gonna have a lot of job changes. I think that's gonna be the most lasting impact of this, uh, of this pandemic. Next slide. And in fact, let me now end by talking about some of those changes and I'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit to keep on time. Uh, world trade, uh, a lot of concern about the virus coming from China. Uh, do we still want to do world trade? I think it's going to continue, but I think there, are, I think we are going to see some what are called supply chain revivals in the country. It's translated, we're going to, a lot of companies are going to say, well, we want to start buying a little more here from the U.S. producers to, to protect us if we have another virus. The other thing that I think North Carolina could particularly have um, uh, access to is I think there's going to be, in fact, the Biden administration mentioned this the other day, uh, there's going to be, I think, a renewed effort to replenish our medical supplies, ventilators, masks, gowns, and we're perfect for doing that in North Carolina. In fact, in terms of ma masks and gowns, where else would you wanna go? We're, we're a great textile state. So look for some opportunities there. Next slide. Uh, we're going to continue, this has been going on for a while, it's sort of been going on slowly, this fact that technology is getting so adept at doing things that we're going to see in some areas uh, machines and robots doing the work of people. We call that technological unemployment. I think the pandemic is speeding that up because there's the added factor here that businesses are now looking at a worker and saying, ooh, if that person gets sick, if we have another virus, that shuts me down. Uh, I give you a real good example of this. We have a large food processing uh, industry in North Carolina. In fact, we have the largest uh, meat packing plant in the world in Tar Heel, North Carolina in Bladen County. I've been by that, it's enormous. It's, it's uh, very labor intensive, but we already are hearing reports from other states of meat packers beginning to replace people in those plants with robots. So that's a good example of what I'm talking about. And this is where I think, this is what's gonna hold our unemployment rate up because I think we're going to have a lot of disruption as economists like to say in the job market. So we need to have a lot of focus on being ready to retrain people for jobs that are available. That are available. Next slide. Education, uh, uh, remote teaching. Uh, of course, we've been doing it at the university level, and in fact, uh, it's expected that's actually going to ramp up even more. Uh, K through 12, of course, was not ready for that at all. And, and I think that we should not blame K through 12 for some of the parents' uh, concerns about this. They just weren't ready. We've been doing it for a long time at the university level. But I saw the day that uh, Wake County said they were going to uh, have remote learning as perhaps a permanent part, an option. I do think that uh, this is going to be a permanent part of education everywhere. So I think that's going to be a change. Not that everyone will do it, but it will be an option. Next slide. Teleworking. 40% uh, of people at the peak of the pandemic were working from home. It was 8% pre. It's down to about 30% now, but it's not going to go away. It's not for everyone, 
but I do think a lot of people now like it. Uh, some businesses like it because they maybe save on, on, um, on cost of renting space. Uh, again, it's not for everyone. There are pluses and minuses, but I think we will we'll see uh, remote working as a bigger part of our economy than it ever was. Next slide. Delivery of services, um, uh, drones. Uh, a lot of people now are getting their food delivered every day and the FAA just uh, made the first level improvement for drone delivery, that's, that's coming. So I think that's another area of disruption, another opportunity perhaps for jobs. Never, next slide. Uh, residential location. Um, if you remotely work, if you get stuff delivered to your home, you can pretty much live anywhere. And uh, there's a thought that many people are going to, or at least not, not everyone, but many people are gonna shy away from living in big metros. New York City metro areas already lost people because of their concerns about another virus and living in dense areas. And I think uh, uh, Treasurer Falwell was talking about Terrell County, which I love. I love going through and stopping in Terrell County. It's a beautiful county. It is a small county. And of course it, it has economic issues, but if we can get high-speed internet into all of North Carolina, and right now the estimates vary, but they vary from 15 to 30% of, of all North Carolinians don't have access to high-speed internet. If we can get high-speed internet into rural North Carolina, I think the, the after-pandemic economy could be one that could prompt a revival of people wanting to live in less dense areas and businesses wanting to locate there. But the key, uh, high-speed internet now is obviously like electricity was 100 years ago. It's really a necessity. Next slide. Um, so uh, let, me, let me conclude by talking about some of the implications specifically for the triangle. First of all, I think we're going to continue to grow, perhaps even at an accelerated pace. I was very interested to see the two major real estate announcements in the last couple of months, downtown South and now the Innovation Center at, at North Hills. Investors aren't going to do, make those kind of commitments, multi-billion dollars, unless they believe this area is going to grow, and it is. In fact, if you look at economic growth in this century, among the 380 metro areas, the raleigh Cary metro, which Nightdale is a part of, was the 12th highest in growth. I do look for more of the growth to be in suburban areas. Again, Nightdale is perfectly positioned for this. Again, the next game changer is going to be universally available high-speed internet. I actually think that's not going to come from cables in the ground or on, on, on telephone poles. It's going to come uh, by what Elon Musk is doing with his SpaceX program. And this is low flying orbiting satellites. They're 600 miles up rather than 20,000 miles if you get your cable from satellite now. And uh, many people think that's really the next step in, in high-speed internet uh, availability, these low flying um, um, uh, orbiting satellites. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, the coronavirus has created permanent uh, personal as well as economic losses. I think it's been uh, more difficult because it's been over hundred years. The Spanish flu, 1917, 1919, that we had anything like this. Uh, it's going to create permanent changes after it uh, in the post-pandemic economy. And I think one lesson here is that we are going to, uh, I, I, when, when the Biden administration uh, uh, presents their budget to Congress, I would expect a big jump in proposed spending with the CDC, et cetera, uh, for money to keep up on viruses, keep up on pandemics. Again, this is what I've read. This is a tricky thing. These viruses pop up all the time. It's very, very difficult for experts to know which could turn into a pandemic. And I think if we, the more money we can spend, or the money that if we spend more money to get better at predicting them so we can be ready for them, I think that's probably going to be money uh, well spent. And I think, uh, Kristen, that's it. So I will uh, stop. Oh, oh, thank you, Kristen. There's my <laughs> cover of my. Um, one of my new books, Real Solutions, and I think you've got the next one also, Kristen. Oh yes, and there's the uh, the novel, This Unia. So if any of you, uh, you've got a choice, you've got uh, the both sides, you've got uh, Real Solutions, which is a policy book, maybe hopefully it won't put you to sleep. This Unia, those are an economic thriller, hopefully it'll keep you awake and, and wanting to turn the page. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Walden. I remember last year in your forecast, you did you did a, just maybe two minutes on a small virus that was brewing 
in the east and that could be oh. the only thing oh. that would come but i wow. every time that you speak i just i physically feel better i i just oh good <laughs> not the opposite <laughs> <laughs> for the economy um we appreciate it thank you next i would like to introduce you all to anna rivera she is uh, with ABC 11 Eyewitness News team, and she joined in July of 2018, and she's waking up with you bright and early. You can see her reports from 4.30 a.m. to 7 a.m. She also reports from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Before moving to the Triangle, Anna worked in a, the land of bourbon and fast horses in Louisville, Kentucky. During her time in Louisville, Anna worked at, as an 11 p.m. reporter and a fill-in anchor at the ABC affiliate channel. She covered a variety of stories in the Bluegrass State, including Crime Rise, and she got to meet the country star, Garth Brooks. Um, so we're very excited to have you here with us today, Anna. We'll be asking the questions of the panelists that have been prepared by Dr. Walden. Um, at the end of that, we'll have some time for a question and answer session from the audience as well. So please save your uh, questions. Feel free to type them in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get them to the appropriate people. All right, thanks so much, Kristen. So first, I want to introduce you guys to our panelists. You guys have already met Treasurer Falwell, um, and you met him earlier during the presentation. So our other panelists are going to be Mayor Jessica Day and Eastern Area Superintendent Dr. Mark Savage. So uh, Mayor Day, she is, I'm going to kind of summarize her bio here. She is a long time, uh, she's done basically everything in Nightdale. We'll say that. She grew up in Nightdale. She's also, uh, she works at agrochemical in agrochemical business with BASF company. Um, she also is a trailblazer in Nightdale. She became the first African-American female to the Nightdale Town Council in 2017, and then became uh, the first African-American female to hold the seat as mayor for the town of Nightdale as well. She's involved in so many different panels and groups, uh, including uh, the Nightdale Rotary Club. So she's just very involved, and if you don't know her as mayor, you probably know her some facet uh, in Nightdale. Also, Dr. Savage began his teaching career at Leesville Road High School in 1997. That, of course, is after teaching in my home state of Delaware for five years. He's been a principal at many different schools throughout Wake County. And then in 2018, he was named as the Eastern Area Superintendent. In addition, Dr. Savage also spearheads leadership development in the district. So let's get right to these questions. Uh, we're going to start with Mayor Day. Uh, the first question, Mayor, is how was the pandemic impacting Nightdale's taxes and spending? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am proud to say that the town of Nightdale continues to experience significant growth and prosperity despite the impacts of COVID-19. Property tax collections are on target. Sales tax currently is exceeding budgetary projections. We have experienced some loss in our recreational revenues, uh, and that's approximately about 70%. And this is due to all of our special events programs and athletics having been uh, canceled to date. But for the past few years, we have focused on proactive strategies and strategic planning. And this year has been no different. We adopted a contingency budget for fiscal year 2021 to 2022 as a proactive strategy to ensure town operations amidst the coronavirus pandemic. The town continues to prosper financially. We are on pace to exceed financial performance in all areas. I did mention, except for the recreation and leisure programming, but I do wanna state that I'm very grateful for our staff who, although we were not able to host the events as we have done in the past, have been very creative in providing activities and additional opportunities for our citizens, including our virtual events and our drive-through events. So I'm just thankful for them to be able to adapt. Thank you so much. I'm gonna kind of jump around. I'm not gonna follow the order on here just so keep everyone on their toes. Dr. Savage, uh, is remote learning here to stay and at what level do you expect to see that? Yeah, so thank you. I, and I appreciate um, Dr. Walden's comments about you know referencing the virtual uh, learning that, that districts are setting up. And, and so we, we agree virtual learning is, is here to stay at least through um, next year as part as uh, you know, we don't know any of the metrics that are going to be in place 
uh, next year. But but to just give you a sense right now, Wake County for this semester, we have about 77,000 students who have chosen the virtual option right now. Uh, that changes somewhat as, as metrics change. People More people decide to go in than those who, ch who choose to opt out and to return to face-to-face -face when that happens. Um, and that's pretty evenly split with, with elementary, middle, and, and high school with folks choosing um, you know, hybrid model or face-to-face -face once we get there versus virtual. So uh, right now, just this week, we our academics team uh, presented to the board sort of uh, you know, the thoughtfulness behind this, right? Well, there's a work group that will be starting soon with principals, teachers, families, uh, students, you know, to sort of review the lessons learned by remote learning. We've, we've learned quite a few um, uh, and, and planning that progress with the community. Um, and, and there are three models that, that the district could take. One is we could continue what we have now, which is the schools are sort of managing their virtual students, right? They're assigning staff based on student need. We could go to a district model where there are, you know, a, a district program where we hire our own staff to provide those district-wise. Um, and then some districts are going with, with a third party to provide that. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at sort of all those assumptions and models. Obviously, there's a lot of dependencies for next year, right? Governor's direction, local health decisions, um, resources, uh, funding. Um, student choice, what, what families are going to choose as metrics change. Um, but I, I, I feel confident, yes, there'll be some level of virtual uh, next year uh, you know, for families. The community is going to shape what that will look like together. Um, and then very possibly you know, from, from here on out. Dr. Savage, just a follow-up question for that. Uh, how will the pandemic change the structure of, uh, of, of schools in the future regarding social distancing and person-to-person -person contact? Or do you expect to see us go back to normal eventually? Yeah, so that, that, yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? So, so when, when is normal and how do we know that we're there, right? Um, so, so, you know, sort of, sort of aligning with, with some of the things I said about virtual, so some of those factors will be, you know, rate of community spread, um, you know, uh, staffing, right? In order to staff a smaller school or, or, or smaller class size where you have 12 students in it, right? Obviously down the road, you, you, need, you need more staff. And this year we've, the CARES Act has provided um, that and students have followed teachers. So, um, so doing that beyond uh, that funding is, is is a question. Um, the ability for each school to social distance, right? So, so an older school with, with smaller classrooms, they may be able to provide, um, you know, for 12 students to comfortably socially distance, while a, a newer school may be able to, to provide for 18, depending on how you define social distancing and how we do it in the future. You know, I, and, and how many students, again, choose virtual. I, I think that ultimately though, right, schools have always um, wanted to provide the lowest class size possible, right? We've always wanted to get those class sizes low. And so um, regardless if, if the need to social distance and the need to do those things are drivers, um, you know, we'll continue to do that, right? We'll, we'll continue to move to have smaller cl um, class size. That, that will be dependent on the state and funding, how we, we fund teachers and all those sort of things. So, um, I, you know, I hate to always give the answer, it depends, but boy, does it, you know, it depends on a lot of things, but those are some of those dependencies. Treasurer Falwell, uh, what will be the long run, run impact of the pandemic on North Carolina's fiscal affairs? I think the long run impact, it may not be mathematical, but, uh, but more psychological. I think that this pandemic has destroyed the joy of achievement and upward mobility uh, for so many of our citizens uh, that are in situations like I was in for a third of my life. Uh, I refer to them as the forgotten woman and forgotten man. And uh, how I describe those individuals are, is that these people work one to two jobs, uh, they pay taxes and they pray for a better outcome. And many of these individuals make their living with their hands and their back and their feet. And I think that 
as we have spent so much attention on flattening the healthcare curve, uh, not enough attention has been spent on how to flatten the economic curve <clears throat> of North Carolina. Uh, some of you may know, and I think Anna, you know this, that uh, almost a year ago, I was in intensive care uh, with COVID-19 uh, for nearly seven days at Baptist Hospital in total when no one knew what to do uh, with folks like me. Uh, no symptoms then, now, or ever. Uh, but my body was rejecting oxygen. Even with eight units of oxygen, my blood ox level was 84, uh, which was very dangerous. And I'd say that not to draw attention to myself, but to say that when I talk about flattening the healthcare curve and flattening the economic curve, in the words of the old Jamie Johnson country music song, I've seen it in color. Uh, I've seen COVID in color, and I know exactly what this looks like. So what we have to do going forward to answer your question is we have to find that balance between uh, focusing on, on the health of our citizenry without punishing the healthy. And uh, that's something that's gonna be very important, especially across rural North Carolina, which I've just talked about before. We have two towns in the Southern part of North Carolina. One's called Shalote and one's called Charlotte. Um, they're spelled very similarly, uh, but, and they're pronounced similarly. But I can tell you that Shalote and Charlotte are in far different boats right now, even though they're both in the same state. Uh, ironically, we have little Shalotes inside the city limits of Charlotte. <clears throat> we have economic uh, despair. Uh, we've had the destruction of the joy of achievement with small business owners, uh, not just in Shalote, but in parts of Charlotte. And, so I think that the long-term impact of COVID uh, is the impact on destroying the joy of achievement and upward mobility. This is gonna be more complicated by the lack of trust and confidence in all levels of government. I know we've had some Rotarians here on the call and it just, you've heard me say this before, it gives me goosebumps to think of where our communities and where our state and where our country could be right now. If all elected leaders adopted the service above self and the four-way test uh, that Rotary abides by. So when you're trying to build confidence in the economy <coughs> and bring the joy of achievement back into our economy, it's very hard to do that when there's so much uh, mistrust. And what I love about this Zoom meeting, there's two things I love about it. One is that I got to speak before Dr. Walden did and, uh, you know, He's the brains and I'm the mule, but of course every team needs one. Uh, but the second reason is that forums like this give your viewers the opportunity to be informed, not affirmed. That is what's so different about this pandemic economically that people are going to be affirmed about something they already feel about any particular subject, public education, public safety, public works or public roads. There are very few places for people to actually be informed about the subject, not just affirmed. And um, I know that was slightly pessimistic, but uh, that's my view. Well, Treasurer Falwell, part of that you mentioned the health healthcare. Um, will there be uh, will there be a need to change the state's healthcare system as a result of the pandemic? Well. This change was necessary uh, before the pandemic. Uh, we have 20% of the people in this state, excuse me, we have people in North Carolina who spend 20% of their income on something they don't know the price and the value of. Now, one day, all of you will be as old as I am. And what that will mean is that you'll know that today is Senior Citizen Day at Food Line and tomorrow is Senior Citizen Day at Harris Teeter which means if you want the senior citizen discount, that's when you go and shop. Now, why do I bring that up in the conversation about healthcare? The reason I bring it up is that if you get rid of secret contracts in healthcare and you push the power to the consumer, the consumer has figured out generally how to consume in every other part of their life except healthcare because of the secrecy and the lack of transparency. Many of you have seen this before, but the state health plan is the largest purchaser of healthcare and pharmaceuticals in North Carolina. 
on behalf of those that teach, protect, and otherwise serve. Uh, 300 million of our $2 billion spend for public service employees goes to UNC Healthcare. And when I attempted two years ago to find out what the state health plan was paying for healthcare at the state hospital, uh, this is what was returned to me as the master charge list. Every single page was redacted. Now, why should you care about this? You should care about this because Warren Buffett said 15 months ago, and I hate to use this term, but rising healthcare costs are the tapeworm on the US economy. Why should Dr. Savage care about this? Because nine years ago, Bill Gates started a sentence by saying the single biggest threat to public education. Just think of how all of the people on this call would end that sentence. You'll never believe how Bill Gates ended the sentence nine years ago. The single biggest threat to public education is how states and local communities account and fund for the pension and healthcare liabilities to public service workers. These invisible things, they're not books, they're not classrooms, it's not broadband connection, but these invisible things are the three biggest budget items of the school systems, of the counties, as well as the city, as well as the state. So getting a handle on healthcare is a big deal, whether we have a pandemic or not. And briefly, just to say this, just imagine for one brief second, if we were known as the state with transparent health care, which means no more secret contracts, no more split billing, no more surprise billing, which afflicts lower and fixed and fixed income people more than any of the rest of us. If we were known as the state with transparent health care, the Secretary of State's office would not be able to operate enough hours for all the companies that would want to relocate here. It's the biggest economic uh, gold rush potentially in the state of North Carolina. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Day, have you seen signs the pandemic is in Nightdale's growth? Um, thank you for that question. And I love listening to um, Dr. Walden speak. So thank you so much for speaking. Last year, we learned so much. And I think this year, we've learned additional information. Um, and I think some of the things that you mentioned in your speech is exactly answering what I am about to say. But um, Nightdale's actually experienced an increase in our developmental proposals compared to 2019. Um, our residential building permitting is slightly down, but that's only due to a lack of inventory, not necessarily due to economic, uh, uh, economic indicators. Our commercial building permits are up. The town is seeing significant interest in warehouse and industrial space. We have several new medical providers that have proposed um, buildings here. And the town is seeing strong interest in our downtown area, which is very exciting in our Nightdale Station Park. We have additional areas that are added there. And I think a lot of that is due to, as you mentioned in your speech, people are moving to the suburban areas, they're looking for places, and Nightdale has become one of the fastest growing cities um, in North Carolina. It also has is one of the safest cities in um, North Carolina, and it is a very valued place. People want to move here, and we're seeing that growth continue. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Savage, the pandemic is expected to dramatically change the job market. Does this have impacts for public education, especially when it comes to high school students? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what Dr. Walton said is, is the same things that we've, we've been thinking about, right, is that um, uh, businesses are going to be um, maybe more reticent to bring a bunch of people on site. Um, they, they are... Uh, looking at you know less hubs and, and more skills in teleworking. I, I think about how last March someone had to train me to open a Google Meet and now I do 15 of them today. So there's a whole lot of soft skills that our, our students will need. Um, I, I too look forward to you know the Wake Tech campus who is already going to bring sort of technology focused education and training around smart manufacturing, uh, microelectronics, automation, all those sort of things that you know, pre-pandemic, we were in the process of working with our high schools on, on providing on-campus you know, career pathways in, in accord with Wake Tech that I imagine will we'll pick up as well um, once we've returned to, to being able to operate in that space. 
uh, all our curriculums are, are being reviewed for a number of reasons. One, to you know, mitigate the learning loss that we know nationally is occurring, right? So, so next year um, is going to have to look different than, than years prior as we work to, to fill those gaps. And, and listen to our business community as far as what skills skills they need. So um, most definitely, uh, you, you know, in all the ways that it'll manifest, it, it's not clear yet. Awesome, thank you. And Treasurer Falwell, we'll go back to you. Uh, do you think North Carolina's uh, competitive position to other states has been enhanced by the pandemic? And if so, can it be leveraged to help close the urban rural divide that you've talked a lot about? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it, it has been enhanced, but it could be further enhanced uh, by having a successful uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, and I just would not ask you to raise your hand, but if I ask for a show of hands, for example, of the people on this call that have ever been to a hospital to get vaccinated, I don't think anybody would raise their hand. I was born in the Rex Hospital in 1958. I spent my entire life basically in Winston-Salem. I've never been to a hospital to get a vaccine. I've been to primary care. I've been to pediatricians. I've been to uh, all pharmacies. So part of this growth or potential growth could be enhanced by a more successful vaccine rollout. And I was reminded yesterday that if if all out, you know, all out spells about the vaccine rollout. I think if we just hand this off to the 17 year olds who run the Chick fil A's at Overland Village, I think we could probably have things work a little bit better. But the other thing I want to draw your attention to, and I'm realizing how hard it is to be man or white because I always get this stuff backwards. <clears throat> uh, Marie, this is the shape of North Carolina, obviously. This is the shape of California, generally speaking. But for 63 miles, we have as much border with other states as California does. And as smart as you all are in Nightdale, no one can name a major population center in California that borders another state. But think about yours, Asheville, Charlotte, Wilmington, some degree, <clears throat> Rocky Mount, Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, Winston-Salem. My point is, is that Dr. Waldron will tell us that Hayek and von Mises have told us for over 100 years that money doesn't know where the border is. Money will go where it's invited and stay where it's spent. And when you have this much population on the border of other states, we have to ensure that we're the low-cost place to live and do business, not the high-cost place to live and do business. And that was true before COVID, but especially after COVID, as people in Charlotte got frustrated with not being able to get a haircut or a hamburger, they drove 12 miles to do so, as well as the same thing with food. 28 miles in Asheville, you know, 60 miles in Wilmington. So we have to continue to focus on being the low cost place to live and do business and to make sure that the policies driving this are transparent, consistent, and what I should have said in my early remarks, we have to have the ability to challenge assumptions to get to the right answers. Thank you. And then I'll round out my questions with Mayor Day. Uh, do you foresee the pandemic changing Nightdale's priorities? Uh, Thank you. As stated earlier, um, we have really focused on our strategic planning and our proactive activities. So in 2019, we adopted the Nightdale Strategic Plan. And the purpose of this plan was to clearly communicate who we are and what we want for our town to be in the future. It was built around our five essential priority areas uh, to ensure Nightdale's future. These, um, the town recognizes the importance of strategic direction in light of our tremendous growth. Our commitment to proactively planning for the future has helped us navigate the uncertainty of this pandemic. We uh, accomplished 100% of our goals in our fiscal year of 2019 to 2020. 
in the fiscal year 2020 to 2021, we accomplished 78 percent of our goals. And I do want to compare when you hear that 78 and if you compare that to 100 in 19 to 20, we had 11 goals. But in 20 to 21, we actually had 36 goals. So we were very ambitious in our goals. And they were connected to the things that we wanted to see in our town. So in light of the impacts of COVID-19, I am proud of our staff and I am proud of what we were able to do to accomplish that 78%. And going into fiscal year uh, 2020 to 2021, what we plan to do is to take those goals that were already stated and already in place. Most of those goals are in the works, not necessarily 100% completed, but we are on our way. Um, and we are planning to take those goals and continue those for our next year. So I wouldn't say necessarily that it has changed anything or changed the direction, but I think it just stresses what we were already doing, which was strategic planning, looking towards the future, and how can we make plans now. Um, we believe that Nightdale is a great place to live, but we want it to remain a great place to live for the next 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years. So how do we plan now? How do we get strategic planning to make sure that Nightdale remains that wonderful, great place to live, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Mayor. That was all of my questions, Kristen, on my end. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through the uh, other questions coming from everyone else, or I don't know if you wanna handle that. Oh, thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for, for being here today. It was a treat to have you. Um, yeah, if there are any questions from the audience, I'll, I'll save mine. If anyone wants to come off a mic, feel free. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dr. Walden, I've got a quick question for you. Um, Town of Nightdale is beginning to embark on a renewed economic development uh, process within our community. Um, and, and we are having broad focuses, but obviously as a small town, we're going to really focus on some areas where we feel like we can move the needle. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on what a small town like Nightdale should focus its most of its efforts on when it comes to economic development. My initial reaction is to focus on the concern that many people will have in moving to Nightdale or any of the suburbs, and that is that they if they have a job in the park or they have a job in Raleigh, they've got to endure the commute. And so to the extent that Nightgale can either A, bring in jobs that bring, bring in jobs that will hire local people, um, or B, um, work with Raleigh, work with the county to, to um, develop um, maybe mass transit ways of moving people. I'm not talking about uh, light rail, I'm maybe talking about the high speed uh, dedicated lanes for buses. But I like the idea of maybe thinking, uh, and this is not outside the box, I think that's the, the concept's already outside the box of thinking about development that centers around work, play, live communities, kind of like Chatham Park is doing, where you have residences, but you have jobs right there on site for residences, you have schools, you have amenities, et cetera. So to the extent that maybe you can talk and think about that, and I don't have any magic wand that well, I can wave to say, this is exactly what you do. But I do, I do get a sense <clears throat> that um, that would be a game winner for Nightdale or any community that, that focused on new kinds of developments that where it's all, all in one, where people don't have to get up at 5.30 and worry about an hour, an hour and a half commute. They can, they can roll out of bed in 15 minutes, they're maybe at their office. And some of this could be tied obviously into remote working also. If re remote working does stay with us and stays at the 30 to 35% level and maybe maybe elevates to there. Beyond that, then that all obviously enhances, that, that removes the commute issue for some. And in that case, I would, I would focus on does Nightdale have the, the um, high-speed internet in place? And if not, what can it do to get that in place? Dr. Walden, I, I have a question also. Yeah, yes. <laughs> We've seen a lot of, like you said, um, big businesses uh, go to work at home situations. Um, 
and it's probably been more efficient for a lot of them. So they may continue that trend. And what, like, what do we expect to see with the commercial landscape of these big buildings and properties? Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's an excellent question. That's one that a lot of economists have been, have been grappling with. Um, I think it's less of an issue in our area in the Triangle or raleigh Cary Metro, however you want to phrase it, in the sense that um, I, I do think that our growth in this region will, it's already, was already uh, above average, as I, I gave you the statistics on this metro, raleigh Cary, 12 highest for growth among almost 400 metros in the country. Uh, in this century, I think that'll actually ratchet up um, because I do. There, I, I think that there will be a re, some level of relocation of businesses and households post-pandemic, as people come to a decision about I don't want to live in this these high dense areas. I don't want to grapple with the traffic. I want a little more elbow room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would I would elevate my projections for the triangle's growth in terms of population and, and businesses as well as 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 well as for um, as well as for um, um, Nightdale. Um, that said, I think you can you can expect that if we have a bigger base, well, I mean, not everyone's going to remotely work. I mean, the highest percentage I've seen anyone project is maybe 50% of the population remotely working at least half not. And so I, I guess what I'm getting at is there'll be enough people here. If we grow fast enough, there'll be enough people to fill up those office buildings. And then the third, the, the final thing I'll say there is as you look at what I mentioned in my talk, the, the two, I mean, just, just blockbuster announcements in the last two months, downtown South, um, that's going to double the size of downtown office space. And then on its heels, just what, uh, three or four days ago, uh, the Innov I think it's called the Innovation Center, but it's North Hills, another major development. So the people with money, and and, and they're you know I'm I'm just an, an, an academic. I can I can project anything, and <laughs> I don't have any money on the line directly. These folks have money on the line, so that tells me the smart people who are making bets with their money in real estate are predicting that yes, there will be more people remotely working, but there's going to be enough people. Uh, who still want to get up in the morning and go to an office. I think the, the lesson though with both of those is uh, tailing back to my, the previous question from I think was Chris, that both of these communities, I don't know that they're selling themselves as live, work, play, but I think it's implicit in them that, that uh, a lot of the people who are going to live in the residential um, space of downtown South and the Innovation Center can also work there and also recreate there. So I think that may be something that this pandemic has pushed along as a development tool. Dr. Walden, I have a quick question for you. Um, I'd actually send it to you in the chat and not sure if it made sense. And I know we're speculating a little bit, but if there is a $15 an hour federal minimum wage mandate, uh, is that a, an economic headwind for small businesses that are still recovering from COVID and uh, the lack of business, or is it a tailwind by providing uh, a boost or stimulus to low wage income earners? Yeah. Well, for a low, low wage income earner, and my first job, I got a dollar an hour. This was 50 years ago, but but it was at the at the bottom, and I certainly have total compassion for people who, for whatever reason, are working at, at minimum wage, and especially if they have a family, others to support, that's a tough, tough life. Um, 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 I, I would say a, a couple of things here. One is I think the long run solution for anyone working in a minimum wage job is for them to get more training so they can go up the ladder, like, like I did, and maybe many of you did. Um, the, the concern with mandating that a business pay a higher wage than they have decided they can, they can deal with is, first of all, small businesses work on an extremely narrow margin, maybe 3% profit rate. And they look, when I was working at the fast food restaurant, they would look at me and say, all right, Walden, um, what, are you, what are you worth to us in terms of hamburgers sold and, and hamburgers made and French fries uh, made? All right, you're worth a dollar an hour. Would I have been worth $3 an hour? Probably not. 
and they would have let me go. So I think that is the, that is the concern I have. There've been tons of economic studies, not everyone, but I'd say, in fact, I just got a paper yesterday that reviewed all of the economic studies ever done in the US on impacts of a higher minimum wage. 70% of them said that if you are one of the lucky minimum wage people who keep your job, you're obviously gonna be better off. But unfortunately, a, a significant percentage of minimum wage people if they are forced to get to be paid more, they lose their job. And that's the concern I have, especially now with innovation being uh, much more adept than when I was working at a dollar an hour. Um, some McDonald's, for example, put in kiosks for ordering and they take away those people. They put me on the French fryer first and then they put me on the grill second. And then they decided I knew math because in those days we didn't have cash register that would add up the prices. I had to do them on a bag and I had to add. And I was good at that. So they put me on the counter. And those jobs are being wiped away. They're kiosks doing that. So anyway, that's, that's a concern I have. But if someone is on a minimum wage position and we decide collectively as a society, that's not enough for them to live, even while even if they're continuing to try to upgrade their skills. I think an alternative would be for the public sector to come in and make up the difference for them, not to force the business, because the business is going to do what's good for the business. Unless we want to have the state take over all the businesses, I'd rather us say, for example, there's been a, uh, there was an economist who's been around, well, actually he's passed, but he had an idea to have uh, public wage subsidies. So if you're making $7.25 an hour and it's decided that you need to make $12 an hour in order to provide for your family and a standard of living, have the federal government make up that difference. Or another way would be to make it up through um, um, social service programs. In fact, in my book, Real Solutions, I talk about this very issue. And one of the problems we have in the federal government, our social safety net is so dispersed. We have about over between 50 and 75 different programs at the federal level that are there to help people live just to get by. There's no coordination. They all have different rules of who qualifies and most of them are, are disincentivizes people to work more and work work uh, and get education because if you get a hundred dollars more in pay, you're take a hundred dollars is taken away from you in um, in benefits. So I, I think we need to reform that dramatically. But I do worry about, um, in fact, the Congressional Budget Office, their latest um, report, which is I think a year or two old. Uh, they actually the Congressional Budget Office is a nonpartisan group that. Um, uh, the Congress set up years ago to study questions like this, and they did, and they concluded that there'll be several million jobs lost if the minimum wage went up. So again, I'm compassionate. I was there. I know this. I want people to, to live an acceptable standard of living, but I'm worried if you just tell a small business, you got to pay this, they're going to react in a way that um, uh, perhaps in the long run is not good for that worker. Great information. I have a question and I don't know who to direct it to specifically. Um, first of all, I want to say this has been great. I've learned so much. I've been over here taking notes. Um, so thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, but wanted to ask about affordable housing, kind of tagging on to that $15 an hour, because that continues to be an issue in every community. Um, me being in the Roseville community, we know that all too well. And I know in Nightdale and other places, how do you address the issue of affordable housing from an incentive standpoint? What's gonna incent developers to want to develop um, affordable housing? We know that's a need, people have a need. I love to see that there's economic growth in the triangle with what all that John Cain is doing. But I also know that that's a displacing a lot of people's homes are being taken away. And so that's a big issue. And that's something that keeps me up at night. So I'd love to have anyone on the panel or all of you, if you choose to address that concern and how we're, how we can meet that need better. Thank you. Sheila, well, I, go ahead. Sorry, doctor. No, 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 go, no, no. I'll, I'll take a break. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, I serve on the uh, North Carolina Housing Finance, Finance Agency Board, uh, which has a lot to do with this. Uh, it should keep you up at night. Uh, the uh, gentrification or whatever words you want to use for what's happening in some of these communities is, is real. Uh, I was, uh, I rent a room in a, in a condominium uh, in Raleigh because uh, my home is in Winston-Salem. I've been here four nights a week and 
And uh, as I was driving in yesterday, one of the neighbors said, uh, well, I just want to let you know we're going to be moving. I said, I didn't know your condo was up for sale. And they said it wasn't. <laughs> Somebody just came in and made an offer on it. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's just the, the cost of housing is just unbelievable. And uh, some of you may know uh, uh, recently I've opined about a ferry system in Bald Head Island. And uh, the reason this relates to your question is it had to do with the, the price of riding the ferry. And on Bald Head Island, for example, which I'd never been to in my life uh, until two weeks ago when I went to look at the ferry system four weeks ago, I realized that five times as many people are going to and from Bald Head Island every day just to service the people who live on Bald Head Island. So uh, what I've said, which has gotten a lot of press in Eastern North Carolina is, this is not about the people who own the yachts, it's about the people who have to wash them. And I think that goes directly to your point about affordable housing. And it goes directly to my earlier point about upward mobility and the joy of, it, of achievement. I would add, I'd add a couple of things. Um, um, one, this in, in economics, everything comes down to supply and demand. And in, in general, in the triangle, we're growing fast. There's only so much land. Will Rogers, the humorist of 100 years ago, said, buy land, they're not making any more of it. And, and specifically land and sites that are close to economic activities people want to be close to, they're going to go up in price tremendously as we have, have growth. Uh, that said, I would encourage every community uh, like Rollsville, uh, Nightdale, to uh, review their local regulations on construction to the extent that we can encourage builders, make it less expensive for builders to build, that will expand the supply. Number two, as part of that review, and this may have to be done at the state level, I have read, and I document this in my, my, my book, Real Solutions, uh, there have been uh, developed a lot of innovative, low cost ways of constructing housing that oftentimes local governments uh, don't allow uh, because in many cases it's off-site building uh, uh, and so you don't get the local jobs. I think you'd wanna review those. And then thirdly, um, land is going to be cheaper the farther out you are. And uh, so uh, one thing to look at is if, we, if, if there are proposals to build affordable housing areas, if you can site them farther out in the, in the, in the, in the um, um, region, uh, land costs are going to be much lower. Then, however, you have to worry about where are those folks going to, to work and if, they're, if they don't have mobility, then you need to also pee, uh, use as part of the package some kind of transit option, uh, which gets back to my notion of if we can build live, work, play communities that, that uh, mitigates that issue. But I think bottom line regulations, trying to encourage more supply, trying to encourage uh, use of, of cheap, lower cost construction materials and methods. Uh, those are approaches, they're not gonna solve the problem. Um, it's just, we are a growing area. Um, and um, um, you, you can look at, uh, and I, I think uh, downtown South, I don't know the exact details of this, but I think downtown South had to agree to some, uh, some plan to include affordable housing as part of their development. That, that's certainly another, another option too. And I will also say, um, and thank you, I am taking notes as well um, from everyone's comments. But here in Nightdale, this has definitely been a topic of conversation. I know Wake County as a whole, this is a major concern and we are having multiple conversations everywhere about this. But um, in Nightdale, we have been a very affordable, when you look at housing as Wake County as a whole, Nightdale has been an affordable community. In the past year, it's positive, um, but when it comes to affordable housing, and it could be negative as well, but we've seen housing prices, we've seen land prices increase dramatically because of the value, because people see the value in Nightdale. And so as it increases, yes, it is a valuable place and people want to move here and want to pay more, but how do we focus on that affordable housing? And I wish I did have an answer, a quick, easy, this is what we are doing, but Unfortunately, we don't have that answer yet, but we are also asking those questions and, and looking forward to uh, what do we need to be doing now? What do we need to put in place 
to um, make sure that we do have affordable housing in Nightdale. We also, and I'll make one other comment too, we're also looking at a mix. We're looking at our entire housing that we have here and how much affordable housing do we have and what is the right amount and what does that look like and the details of that as well, so. I, I just wanted to mention that um, in Fast Company magazine earlier this week, there was an article entitled, Charlotte may have um, cracked the code on affordable housing and I put the URL to that article in the chat box. It, it, is, it is one solution, it's a small solution, but just in the principle of trying to stimulate ideas, the URL is there if anyone is interested. Um, Kristen, may I add that, uh, this is the treasurer, that whether it's public education, public housing, public safety, public works or public roads, uh, if you're a public servant and you can't get excited about advocating for the invisible, then you need to leave whatever it is you're doing <laughs> because you have to advocate for the invisible. Uh, the people who need these services, who, as I said earlier, who want that upward mobility and joy of achievement in their life. And if you can't get excited about advocating for the invisible, no matter what your responsibilities are, you probably should get another line of work because that's really what it's all about. If I, if I can on that is, you know, it, it seems trite to say that, that COVID did not create inequities. It just shone a light on them. And that, that's true. And I think any industry in, in public education, in everything. And so we, we do have an, um, an unbelievable opportunity for a more thoughtful reset on how we bring those inequities um, into balance. So I appreciate those comments. Well, Dr. Savage, I'll just add as elegantly as I can uh, what Warren Buffett said in his annual report 28 years ago. Uh, sorry to put this visual in your mind, but he said that you can't tell who doesn't have a bathing suit on until the tide goes out. Uh, now, the tide went out and then it especially in rural North Carolina over the last 20 years, but then with COVID, it really, the tide really went out. And uh, that was accurate what you said. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna steal that one for select audiences. I appreciate that. That, that is exactly right though. <clears throat> Treasure Fawa, you've had a couple of comments that I'm gonna steal for future audiences. You're great at that. Um, I do have a question from the audience. Uh, and she wasn't sure who to direct this to, but anyone, please feel free to jump on it. What impact does business property tax have on the rural areas? I have an accounting and tax service business and about 80% of my new clients never heard of business property tax and are filing for the first time. Would someone making more small businesses aware of this help increase the revenue for more rural communities? Wow, uh, I thought I knew what business property tax was until you asked that question. <clears throat> I just, um, you know, whatever business you have, whether you're leasing it or renting it or owning it, either you or the landlord are paying business property taxes. Um, so I'm not sure if the question is going to something maybe more related to inventory or not. And I know a lot of those laws about uh, inventory and transition and how long something sits in your business before you have to pay certain taxes and all of that. That's more better question for the Secretary of Revenue, but it is a great question. Yeah, I would agree with Treasurer Falwell. I'm not I'm, I'm not aware of that as a specific concept. Obviously if you own if you business property is going to be taxed, there's going to be a property tax there at the local level. We used to actually have a state property tax. <coughs> uh, we don't have that anymore. Um, but maybe um, there's, you have a tax accountant among um, Nightdale residents, I'm sure that that could be sent to, but I'm not aware of anything particularly or special about that. I would like to add that some of these businesses have gotten you know, money to help them through this process, but I got many calls over the last three weeks of people who their property tax on their business is over $100,000 a year and they've not been allowed to open since St. Patrick's Day. So how can you possibly pay property tax on a business when you have not been allowed to open since St. Patrick's Day? 
this is a real dilemma. And as you know, property taxes on the lean, in the lean world, L, I used to stutter, so sometimes I spell L-I-E-N world. You know, property taxes not paid are at the very top of that chain. Okay, thank you. Unless there are any other questions from the audience. Awesome. Well, this has been a great presentation, Dr. Walden, um, the chamber and the rotary of a gift for you. So we very much appreciate you coming. Um, Sheila will make sure that that gets to you. I did want to add for the Rotary Club of Nightdale, they are hosting their meetings on the Zoom platform. Um, you can uh, welcome to attend a Rotary meeting as a guest on Wednesdays from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, and additional details can be found on the Facebook page. This meeting has been recorded and I know I probably will go back and review it several times because there was so much information that it was hard to digest in one setting. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Treasure follow, go ahead. I just wanna leave you uh, uh, with something biblical that I hope will uh, you can share it throughout the day and you expect this from somebody the last name of Falwell, even though it's spelled differently and we're not related. But, but the Bible admonishes us that anytime that we're faced with uncertainty and or anxiety, there's only but one choice, and that is to give more, whatever that means. When faced with anxiety and uncertainty, our only option is to give more. And I hope that we will all focus on doing that today. Excellent. Lean into gratitude. That is a great uh, way to end this meeting. So again, I appreciate you all coming. Um, please feel free to check out uh, the chamber page. We should be uh, posting the recording. If you would like to share it with your friends and colleagues, um, I think everybody needs to hear the information that was discussed here today. Thanks. Thank you.